Welcome to Chapter 8 of the Climate Change Course. In this chapter, we'll be looking at the implications of climate change for conservation planning. The course material has been prepared by Belinda Reyes of CSIR Environment Tech. For those of you not familiar with the field, a brief introduction to conservation planning follows. It can basically be defined as the use of systematic techniques to identify priority areas for conservation attention, be that protected areas or other forms of conservation management. A good summary of the field is presented by Margulis and Pressy in their 2000 publication in Nature magazine. This slide summarizes the process of conservation planning. Spatial data on biodiversity, land cover transformation, and protected areas are inputs into the process, along with conservation targets for that biodiversity, such as the number of species or the area of ecosystems desired as goals of the conservation plan. The software and GIS process this data and provide outputs of conservation priority areas, which can differ depending on the software, conservation plan, and the inputs. Traditionally, the field of conservation planning has a very static focus and is based on the distribution of biodiversity at one point in time. More recently, there has been a strong shift towards a dynamic approach to conservation management. This dynamic management process takes into account various elements of available biodiversity data, including species distributions, the extent and types of habitat, and the ecological and evolutionary processes that gave rise to and act within the area being studied. If one looks at this slide of the current distribution of species richness for a selected set of taxa in the grasslands of South Africa and compares it to the predicted distribution of that species richness under conditions of climate change, one understands that planning for the conservation of these species will differ between current and future scenarios of climate change. This is the challenge that must be met by modern conservation planners. Additionally, this work on the distribution of species in South Africa shows how the current and future plant diversity and distributions in the country will differ significantly, and thus a conservation plan based exclusively on current information will not cater for what the future holds. The blank spots on the future distribution do not mean necessarily that the northern areas of the country will rapidly become desert, but rather that the species distribution in these areas is likely to be dominated by weedy species, fast-spreading adapted aliens, and small numbers of the extant species that are existing in a marginal habitat. Work on conservation planning now indicates that the conservation strategies we use today will soon be obsolete under conditions of climate change. Examples in support of this statement are the predictions of what will happen to flagship protected areas in South Africa, where many of the current endemic species are likely to be lost. For more details on this, have a look at the papers of Rutherford and Erasmus. There is thus an urgent need to include the implications of climate change into conservation planning, and ensure that conservation planning becomes dynamic. Most importantly, it must include the constraints of future climate change, these novel conservation strategies have been termed Climate Change Integrated Strategies, or CCS for short. So what is needed for these strategies to work? HANA presents an overview of these Climate Change Integrated Strategies, which specifies the needs for regional modelling of biodiversity responses to climate change, the selection of new protected areas with climate change as an integral factor, management of bi biodiversity at a broader landscape level, regional coordination of management, and the principle of polluter pays, currently being implemented in many places, are being included in plans, and thus facilitate these CCS. This presentation presents an overview of some of the CCS types of conservation planning available. These include biome movement models, gradient mapping, and detailed climate change studies on particular species. These steps allow for planning of escape routes or movement corridors for species under extensive threat of climate change. At this stage, however, most of this planning is theoretical, with minimal integration and with regional planning initiatives as yet. The appropriate methods for a practical framework will depend on the data, infrastructure and expertise available, and to a large extent the types of climate change integrated strategies used will both be dependent on regional requirements and determine the optimal integration. This framework presents the CCS methods and their requirements, which will enable users to decide which is the most appropriate. The CCS methods are presented as Tier 1, 2, and 3 methods. <laughs> 
As one moves from tier 1 to 2 to 3, so the data and expertise requirement to the CCS method increase, whilst the complexity of the strategy also increases. The following slides will work through this framework with examples. Tier 1 Climate Change Integrated Conservation Strategies aim to identify areas of the greatest stability or resilience to climate change from a biodiversity perspective. They require data on broad biomes climatically defined and, if possible, topographic information. They also require expertise in modeling the current and future distributions of these biomes in a climatic manner. The method uses the current and future distributions of biomes to identify areas of the greatest similarity or stability under one or more scenarios of climate change. It is then possible to refine these areas by selecting from them topographically diverse regions. This slide demonstrates Tier 1 CCS methods. This is a slide of the current and future distribution of South Africa's biomes taken from work by Sanby. Following on from the previous slide, this slide demonstrates the biomes and areas of highest stability in the biome under three scenarios of climate change. The darker areas are more stable under more scenarios. From these stable areas, areas of topographic diversity can then be selected, as demonstrated by the next map. These areas can then be fed, along with other data, into a conservation plan. Tier 2 methods assess areas of current and future importance to conservation based on the predicted distributions of selected species. The data requirements are broad-scale species distribution data, and the expertise required includes the ability to, to model species distributions and conservation planning experience. This method involves identifying areas of high conservation value based on current and future species distributions, which can then be refined to include areas of overlap. This example, from the grasslands of South Africa, shows the conservation value of grid cells measured as irreplaceability for the current distribution of a suite of species. This next slide shows the conservation value for the future predicted distribution of these same species. One can use these two products, their differences and their overlap, in a conservation plan. Areas that remain important under current and future conditions are critical. Areas that are either not important currently but become so, or areas that are important currently and lose this importance later, need to be assessed and sensibly included. Climate change integrated studies on the third tier acknowledge the fact that species need to get from point A to point B as they track changing climate. But the data and expertise requirements are very complex and demanding, and are held only by few institutions and individuals currently. The data required for this level of planning include information on the fine-scale species localities, and life history information on these species required to model their movements from point A to point B. In other words, the distance travelled in a single sli time slice. The expertise is complex. The method focuses on identifying areas and corridors required by the species to track the climate change. Work on this type of climate change integrated study is novel and is in press for a South African example. It relies on several assumptions as do most climate change integrated studies. And these assumptions include the basic assumptions of niche based modeling, the basic assumptions of GCM projections, and the assumptions of dispersal, although this later assumption is dealt with more explicitly in this climate change integrated study than in previous ones. Usually the assumption is that the biodiversity features either have full migration from point A to point B, or they don't make it at all. This climate change integrated study allows for species specific parameterization, and thus does not make the assumption of full or of no migration. This work, done by Midgley and Hughes, worked with 336 protea species at 60,000 sites and with 250,000 records of presence absence, all of which comprises a very detailed database. Using the Hadley 2 GCM output and combining this with five bioclimatic variables, they modeled 10-year intervals of species movement under climate change at a one-minute grid scale. The migration rate, and thus the distance moved, was determined by the dispersal agent used by each species. These maps show the movement of these species per decadal time slice, 
and illustrate the outcomes for species using null, full, and partial assumptions of migration. As you can see, assuming no migration, there is a good chance that all of The method of time slice modeling was applied to the problem of conservation planning, as shown in a paper by Williams et al., which is still currently in press. Time slice modeling is a method of identifying multiple corridors of connectivity through changing habitats as they become suitable. It seeks to minimize, firstly, the dispersal demands on a species, such as expecting it to cross large areas of transformed land, and it also seeks to minimize the amount of land required for preparing these corridors, for budgetary reasons. The ultimate goal is to represent each species, wherever possible, in at least 35 grid cells, each of which is approximately 100 square kilometers in size, at all times between 2000 and 2050, despite the shifting of the climate. This is done by identifying the species dispersal chain backwards from feasible areas of survival in 2050 to current distributions. A heuristic algorithm in the world map package was used, and it selected only viable habitats within a specified distance of the population. This is all explained graphically in the following slide. The method searches backwards from 2050 for corridors linking cells through the decadal time slices. The cells have to be a set distance apart depending on the dispersal agent. This figure has a dispersal of one cell per time slice, so that each decadal transition must find a species in a cell adjacent to the current distribution. The process in this case resulted in only one viable corridor linking the species, moving one cell per year from 2000 to 2050. And it's interesting to note that it did not link the largest population, but rather from a small side population. This is the output of one of these assessments for the proteaceae. The light gray cells are those cells with 66% or more transformation of habitat. The green cells are cells that already existing protection. And the red cells are those chosen to represent goal essential chains, that is, transition areas from current to future distributions. The blue cells chosen are, represent complete chains for species part represented within existing protected cells or other goal essential cells. And the orange cells are chosen using an iterative complementarity algorithm based on greedy richness.